great expectation. I don't know what you're expecting today, but um, what I'm expecting kind of overwhelms me. So I'm just going to try to step into it as courageously as I can. And you can be praying for me throughout the message. So that'd, that'd be really cool. Um, but we, we, actually, we actually believe these some crazy things here at the Adventist Church. We believe God is alive. And um, he is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And that Jesus went to a cross, died for your sin and mine, and overcame that, that sin and that death. So, like, we believe that he's actually both alive, but also victorious over our sin and death. And we believe that without Jesus, you have no hope to know God in a real relationship. And actually, God's righteous and just, and, and he's got to punish you. But we believe that in Jesus, he doesn't have to punish you. That, that he can call you son, that he can call you daughter, he can call you friend because he punished Christ in your place. And, and you, can, you can find a home again with God. You can find forgiveness and uh, adoption into the family of God. You can find fellowship with God. You can find God to be a friend and a comfort and to be a real relevant person in your life, not just something that, you know, some other people uh, talk about. Like that's, that's available to you, even right now. No matter what your uh, religious background is, no matter what you brought in here, we believe that the person of God is available to each and every one of us through the death and resurrection of, of Christ. And, uh, and, it's, and he's, he's out here, he's with us, and that he invites you to believe upon Jesus to receive all that. Um, and so those are some things that we believe, and we believe that Jesus left, um, he, he ascended into heaven, then he, he left a person um, in charge, if you will. He left a person to do his work until he'll come back again, and that's the person of the Holy Spirit. So every time we gather on Sunday, we actually expect the person of the Holy Spirit to be here in a special and cool way, in ways that he can't be with us when we're out separate. Now, he's with us when we're out separate, but there's something special and unique when God's people gather in unity and make much of Jesus. And so it's hard to explain. It just happens. And we're expecting it to happen again here this Sunday, and we expect it, we expect it to actually happen um, every Sunday. And so those are, our, those are our great expectations, that we don't know exactly what God's going to do when we gather together. We're just like, what you, what, what's going to happen this week? And that's the posture that we want you to come in here with as we talk about great expectations, that there's a living God that wants to encounter you and wants to encounter us. And so uh, we're, we're going to, that's going to be our posture as we walk through. We're in a series. Uh, we're going to be spending about eight weeks, and we're talking about the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, because that's, that's where our great expectations come from. Um, we, we have this thing around here called Vision 2020, where we're expecting greater things. Uh, Jesus said, uh, that in, if, if you'll look in um, uh, John, actually we have the verse so you don't have to look, but we, we kind of anchor all of our messages to this. And Jesus makes this crazy quote and he's like, hey, listen, uh, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Okay, so Jesus was really into multiplying himself. He wasn't, he didn't think it would just happen in those three years. He thought that it would be multiplied way far outside of him. And so you're going to do those works, okay, uh, and greater works than these because I am going to the Father. So the question we always want to begin with um, when it comes to expecting greater things in Vision 2020 is what did Jesus do? And what are these great, greater works? Well, essentially, Jesus claimed that he was a doctor for the... Okay, we're going to try this again. Okay. He was a doctor for the? Yeah. And he loved to see sick people made well. Or we're going to look at today. He loved to see dead people come alive. That was, the, that was the essence of what Jesus did. All of his feedings, all of his miracles. He's walking on water. It points to people getting in relationship with Jesus so that they can become a part of the kingdom of God. So that they can come alive spiritually. And so um, that, that's his work. And even greater works means that uh, in, in those three years, some really cool things happen. But even at the birth of the church, it, it like moved into exponential growth, even in that one day. And it's been doing that more and more and more. So the greater works is that we as a body, we as a family, will, will take that same message of the gospel where Jesus says, hey, you can come and I have life for you that you can't find anywhere else. Jesus believes that we as a body are going to take that and it's going to go further and deeper than it ever could during his three-year tenure. Why? Because the Holy Spirit fills us to do that. Okay, so that's the greater work. So we're believing that over the next two years, we're going to see a ton of people come to Jesus and look to him for life. We just, that's like a real simple, straight-edge vision is that we are believing that in our next two years, we are going to see a ton of people who don't know about this God who wants to know and love them 
and care for them and, and, and bring them to life. We're going to see a ton of people who were far from God become very close to God over the next two years. We're, just, we're believing for that. And so for that to happen, um, we would need to do a couple things. The first one is we'd need to learn what it means to expect greater things. You can say expect greater things, but there's actually a learning curve to that, you know? It's not like you just wake up and, and you, you, you shift expectation. I think for a long time, myself included, we've been, and I'm not saying necessarily just the Avenue Church, but the church maybe in America, has been a culture of attendance and not expectation. So in, in the American church, we know how to show up for stuff, but we don't know how to show up and expect upon God for stuff. And so we're learning. We're learning how to do that. And we're learning a lot about the person that we expect upon, which is the person of the Holy Spirit. And I have to tell you, I don't know about your experience over the last couple of weeks. Sam kicked us off, and then we've been, um, you know, last two, three weeks talking about the Holy Spirit. It seems like the more we talk about and invite the Holy Spirit, he's been doing something really sweet among us. I mean, if you've been here the last couple of weeks, it's just been really sweet and powerful. And so uh, we're, we're excited about that today. And, and that's kind of where we, we relaunch back into our series where um, who did God leave us? And what did God leave us with? What do we need? And so we, we always start sort of with this blank here. Uh, let's see the next slide. We need another, not strategy. You don't need another podcast. You don't need another, um, you know, vision statement. You don't need all those things. We need another person. We need another. If we're going to see like the amount of people double over the next two years um, that, that believe in Jesus, that give their lives to Jesus, um, we're going to need another person to do that. Because I don't know about you, I'm not like the most incredible evangelist. Like I, I look at my gift mix and evangelism doesn't show up in the top three, actually, I don't think. Which is really weird that God would give me a vision of crazy evangelism and I'm not even a good evangelist. I mean, think about that for a second. That's like God calling you to do something, and it's like Moses, but he can't really talk. <laughs> and Moses is going to be the one who takes his people out of Egypt. So I am so convinced that we need another person to see this evangelical fruit happen that it's, it's like not even funny. And I, I would just, I'm just curious because some of you are actually amazing evangelists. Like God's gifted you in the area of evangelism, like sharing your faith or talking about the gospel and then seeing people come to faith. Um, th so this isn't, this isn't like, uh, this isn't glory to you. It's glory to God. But if you are an evangelist and you've seen God do like cool work through your life and through evangelism, I mean, that's like one of your gifts. Just slip up your hand. We're, we're not going to clap. I just want to see who, who, who we got. Who did God deal us at the Avenue Church? All right, I got one, two, three. Wait, why did you guys all sit together? That's three. This is like evangelists committee meeting, down left. All right, it's cool. Should we wait for more? No, no, we don't have to wait for more because we have another person. It's okay. It's cool. So we have some people who are actually gifted in that area of evangelism. And, and then we have, it seems like, quite a few of us who maybe aren't, or we don't know if we are. What would that be? It's totally cool because God has sent us another person who's really good at evangelism, who's really good at winning people's hearts and convincing them that Jesus is where life is at. And his name's the Holy Spirit. So rather than beating ourselves up or rather than thinking like, man, like I gotta get to work, we should really be asking ourselves the question, how can I connect more, engage more with this person who loves to do evangelism and is really, really good at it? That's, that's why we're spending like eight weeks here with the Holy Spirit and, and studying these things. And so, um, man, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts 1, and we're going to be taking a look at sort of the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Simon Sinek, in his famous TED Talk, uh, says the question is, uh, start with why. Start with why. It's a statement. Start with why. That's always like the most important thing. It's, you know, these TED Talks are like 12 minute, you know, and they kind of explode into one area. And and so Simon Sinek has this talk that's all about no matter what you're doing, it's always important to start with the why. So as I, as I look at the Holy Spirit, let's start with the why. Why do we have the Holy Spirit? Like, wh like why would Jesus leave? I could think of some other strategic ways besides somebody leaving who was as effective as Jesus and then thinking that it's going to get better. But Jesus is like, so, so, the, so the why, Jesus is like, this is better for you. The why of the Holy Spirit, where we spent a couple of weeks talking about the inward why. 
So if, if you're kind of new with us, I would just encourage you, check out some portions of those last two weeks because you'll learn about what the Holy Spirit does to you on the inside, how the Holy Spirit like brings you to life, how the Holy Spirit teaches you things and encourages you and convicts you of sin and all these sort of things. And so there's, a, there's sort of a personal answer to this question as it pertains to God's children and their walk with him. But there's also an outward answer to this question. There's this very specific reason why we have the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the problem. If you're like me, you're really into me. You're not into me, but you're into the you version of me. Okay, so like we're really into ourselves. So we love thinking about the purpose of the Holy Spirit for us, and we become almost consumed with our own self-transformation and like what the Holy Spirit is doing within me. And that's, it's cool to like understand that, and it's great to lean into that, like how the Holy Spirit is ministering to your heart and comforting and changing you. That's awesome. But there is a whole other world out there that some of us never get to where we've, we don't either understand or we've forgotten that we have not just received the Holy Spirit so that we would benefit. We've received the Holy Spirit so that we would have power to share the message of Christ and see people go from death to life. Like that's why God gave you his Holy Spirit, not simply to make you a better husband, not simply to, to make you um, uh, flourish in your workplace and bring the kingdom of God there. That's true. But in the midst of me being a better husband and in the midst of me flourishing at work, I have to remember that I have a specific calling on my life that if I'm not pointing people to Jesus, I'm off mission. And so we have, what's the purpose of the Holy Spirit? The purpose of the Holy Spirit is that we would have power to go out and share the message of Christ. So if we're not going out and sharing the message of Christ, we're missing out on the heart of God. And I know you don't want to do that. I know you all. You don't want to do that. Here's what Jesus says as he, as he begins to answer some of this question. Uh, you have an outline there that'll, that'll have, again, most of these verses um, that you can spend some time on at home. Jesus is like, uh, remember he says, you're going to do these greater works. And then he says, because I'm going to the Father. Because I'm going to the Father. That's the end of John 14, 12. So the only reason you're going to be able to do these works is because I'm bouncing out of here. And this always implies when Jesus goes, he's sending someone else. He's sending the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, even in, as he's encouraging the disciples and saying they're going to do greater work and he's encouraging us, He's telling us, he's telling us why. He's telling us the purpose of the Holy Spirit, even right here. Because I'm going to go there, you're going to get the Holy Spirit, and that's what's going to empower you to do these greater works. Well, it shows up dramatically in Acts 1. This is where we'll be spending, uh, you know, a lot of our time. Acts 1, verses 8 through 9. So let me set the context for you of, of Acts. The disciples, Jesus' friends, um, have been saddened and then gladdened because they, they've seen their, their, their king and their leader crucified, but then they've seen him alive again. So they're probably a bit confused and overwhelmed all at the same time. And then Jesus um, comes to them and he's like, listen, I need you guys to gather together, uh, like, kind of like you evangelists. You must have got that message to sit together. I need you guys to gather together and wait for the Holy Spirit because I'm gonna send you the Holy Spirit. And when you get the Holy Spirit, then you're gonna have this power to go out and share with people. And people are actually gonna respond in a positive way. All right, cool. So they're all together. Um, they're in Jerusalem, they're, they're all together and they're in this like room and they're, and they're waiting for the Holy Spirit. Now they don't even know what that means, right? I mean, if I were to tell you right now, go this week, just wait for the Holy Spirit. Just wait. You wouldn't maybe know what that, that means necessarily, but they did some things that are important. They gathered together. It seemed like they were like praying and they had a posture that was like looking for Jesus to do something and, and, um, and they were expectant. So they were, they were together, they were, they were prayerful, and they were expectant. And then we're going to see in, in Acts 2 that Jesus fulfills this. But let's check out this promise and, and see kind of a, a little bit beyond the surface of the purpose of the Holy Spirit. So Acts 1, verses 8 through 9. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took them, took him out of their sight. So this is the last time that Jesus has words with his uh, disciples. He ascends into heaven 
And they are then supposed to wait for this Holy Spirit. But, but before we look at Acts 2 and we see when the Holy Spirit actually came, let's, let's just take a look here at some of the, the words that Jesus gave and see if we can't get a greater understanding for how this might apply um, to us. Okay, so these are, these are again, um, I've, I've said his name before. I encourage commentary work and doing some um, beside the scripture study. David Guzik and Enduring Word is a great resource. And so you'll see that there's, some, there's quite a bit of influence from that particular study that I think you guys would enjoy as well. So these are the, these are the parting words to his, to the, to his crew. These, this is his crew, and he's like, this is what I want to tell you. You know, Jesus does everything in perfect timing, right? And so it wasn't like he was rushed, and it wasn't like he was at a loss for words. He knew exactly what he wanted to say. If this was my last message, and I knew it, I'd be pretty particular about what I told you. And I would want those words probably to last and multiply. And so these are Jesus' last words to not only those, his, his like original crew, but to this crew, this, this band of crew that's, that's been called into action as well. And he's like, a, a couple, couple of things I want you to know. First of all, basically to sum it up, I'm gonna give you another person and here's what you're gonna do with that other person. You're gonna go out and be my witnesses. Now you know what a witness is, right? We don't, we don't need to overcomplicate things. A witness is somebody who simply says, this is what I saw or this is what I experienced. I'm a witness to this. So as we talk about evangelism and sharing your faith and things like that, you don't need to be a theologian. Jesus didn't send you the Holy Spirit so that we would become theologians, so that we would become amazing apologetics, so that, so, so that we would be able to defend our faith to all sorts of people groups. It's not bad if you can do that. And some of you are actually gifted in that. And I hopefully have your numbers when I get asked questions I can't answer. I'll be like, hold on. Let me call Steve Pekosha, John O'Brien, Lois Pekosha. I've got people. I got my people. Because I can't answer that question. I don't know. I don't know. The Holy Spirit is not to make you this amazing preacher and teacher. Like, that's not why you got the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers you to simply be able to tell your story. How have you experienced and witnessed Jesus? Just tell it. The Holy Spirit gives you power to point other people to what's happened to you, to point other people to what Jesus has done on their behalf and your behalf. That's it. We don't need to overcomplicate it. And so let's take, let's, let's take a look at some of the things here that Jesus um, gives to them in this, final, um, in this final sort of like exhortation. He says that they're going to um, receive power, but the question is uh, like, what is that power going to look like? And then how are we going to use it? So first of all, the power is a person. We really kind of like try to drive this down in the first two messages, that the Holy Spirit is not just this mysterious force, although he is forceful and mysterious. He's an actual person. He's like, he's like Nate. He's like Stacy. Like, they're people. Now, there's a force of Nate. There's a force of Stacy. As a matter of fact, my son feels their force because they were instrumental in starting our youth group. So the force of them is real, and people are benefiting from it, but they're actually people. I can talk to them. I can actually call them would you guys come here for a second, please? Just like literally, come here. Let's give it up for Stacy and Nate. I'm going to give him a quick hug because this is what we do. Hey, what's up? Now look at this. So, so they were here prior to me calling them up, but now they're actually here in a special and a unique way, right? Like we can all see them. We can all experience them. I actually um, embrace them. And, and drew closer to them in this way than I did when they were over there because I invited them to come forward. And now you all are seeing that they're manifesting themselves in a different way because there was an invitation to them. Because why? Because they're real people. They didn't, they didn't expect it. They didn't, but, but they're, they're cool. They can handle it. They can, <laughs> they'll, they'll let me know if like, please don't do that again. But, but I know I can do this with them. But here's the deal. Like, be, because they're, they're real living people, they not only have influence out there, we can experience like intimate engagement and you can actually begin to experience them in a different way because they were invited forward. All right, so the Holy Spirit operates in much the same way. The Holy Spirit has force. The Holy Spirit is mysterious. The Holy Spirit is affecting a ton of people, but the Holy Spirit is a person himself that can be invited and once invited, then engaged in a different way than just the general attendance of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? All right, let's give it up for these guys one more time. Thank you, guys.
so it's a person. But, but what's the power for? And we talked about this a little bit before. Is, is the power for just personal uses? Or is, does the power have a, like a, a fruitfulness to it? Does the power have an outward facing effectiveness that we should be engaging? Because if I were to invite them and I were to share with them my issues, my struggles, and I were to ask them to comfort me and help me, they would, they would do that. And that's, that's one side of the Holy Spirit. But there's another side for me to then go out to the city of Delray Beach and, hey, let's talk to some of my friends who don't know Jesus, and will you come with me, and will you help me in that? And will you help tell the story? And will you, will you not only be with me, but will you support me, and will, will you share some of the things that God's been doing in your life? And, and in that fashion, I would not have only received the inward working of their comfort and their power, but, but because I would have taken them out with me and then engaged my friends who don't yet know this loving God, it would be a much more effective conversation if the three of us were to go than if I were simply to go in my own power. And so that's what Jesus is inviting his disciples and thus us, his future disciples, to do. It's not just personal, it's also productive. Then there's this, this verb, verb tense here, shall be my witnesses, shall be my witnesses. If you have your Bibles, that's probably a good one um, to underline. That's a, that, that was kind of a game changer for me in learning. I didn't know this, so this is just fresh learning for me. But, but the, the tense of, of that phrase, especially the verb tense, shall be my witnesses, it's not a command, it's a consequence. It's important. It's not a command of God. It's actually a consequence of the Holy Spirit. So here's, here's not what he's saying. He's not saying... You're going to receive power from the Holy Spirit. Now, here's my command. You have to go out and be awesome evangelists. This is, this is what the tense, that would be the imperative tense of the Greek language, where it's imperative that you do this. It's not written in the imperative. It's written in the indicative. And the indicative means it indicates something. It doesn't command something. And here's, here's, how, here's how it reads. It indicates that if you have been filled with the Holy Spirit, the consequence of that, the natural outworking of that is that you will go and be effective evangelists. You see the difference there? This isn't a guilt trip where Jesus is like, man, you need to share your faith more. Man, I gave you my Holy Spirit. You're wasting him. <laughs> you know, like he's, this is Jesus saying, I want to tell you what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to fill you with my Holy Spirit and then it's not going to be because you tried really hard or you trained really hard or you did. It's going to be the natural outworking of being filled with my Holy Spirit is that you're going to start to have a, a heart for lost people and you're going to start to actually be able to engage with them in a way that's been more effective than you've ever done before. Do you understand the difference? It's, it's a consequence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. It, it's not the same imperative as a command. Now, does Jesus command his disciples to go and make, and, and make disciples in Matthew 28? Yeah, that's, that's a command. So we see that Jesus wants us to do it. We see that he's, he has commanded us to do it. But in this passage, as it pertains to the Holy Spirit, he's telling his, his guys and he's telling us that as we are filled with the Holy Spirit, the consequence of that is going to be greater evangelical movement. So the question isn't, uh, are you an, uh, do you have the gift of evangelism or not? The question isn't, have you been trained in this or that? Or the question isn't, have you done your work? The question is, how then do I be filled with the Holy Spirit? If that's actually the key to becoming the evangelist that God's called me to be. And aren't you glad that I think we have two full weeks on being filled with the Holy Spirit, although they're not this week. So you can't, you can't not come. You can't not come again. But I have a quote I think that's really helpful in this moment as it pertains to being filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's what... Here's what um, David Guzik says, before we can be filled, we must, we must recognize our emptiness. By gathering together for prayer, in obedience, these disciples did just that. They recognized they did not have the resources in themselves to do what they could do or should do. They had to rely instead on the word of God, the work of God. So there's a couple of the pieces there that they had to recognize their own emptiness which has given me great encouragement realizing that I'm not that much of an effective evangelist, 
but so I can be empty. It's cool. Like you can still do, people can still come to faith around me, even though it's not necessarily my gifting. I can start on empty. That's the cool part about the gospel. Actually, you can't receive the gospel unless you start on empty. And, and, and it's the same way with being filled with the Holy Spirit. You, there's no formula, but, but these are some observations. You can't be filled with the Holy Spirit unless you start on empty and be like, I got nothing. I got some gifting maybe, these people, but it's still nothing unless you fill it. And, and then they were gathered together in prayer, and we see a big emphasis on corporate gatherings and prayer together. Not necessarily to the expense of personal time with God, but I think sometimes we're like personal time with God, and corporate time's like, eh, maybe. But if you look at the New Testament, it was like corporate time with God was a must. I'm going to start preaching this being filled with the Holy Spirit sermon, so I got to stop, okay? Because I, there's really cool things there that I want to like explore with you, but I just want to highlight those together in prayer, in obedience, in needy for God's spirit. That's a good place to start. We'll flesh, we'll flesh that out in, in some weeks to come. And, and here's, here's where they were to go. Here's where they were to go. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And, and he said that there would be these greater works that they would be able to do. And it's interesting um, because... Again, in the commentary, these weren't necessarily their ideas of greater places. These weren't their ideas of greater places, and yet they were called to do greater works because in each of these places, there, it, there was like persecution that waited. Now, for a while, Jerusalem was okay, but Jerusalem was also the place where their Jesus got crushed. So to think that they're going to start a ministry in the same place where it was like Jesus got nailed to a cross is not that appetizing. And then you add in Samaria. Well, they've got huge prejudice against Samaria. They don't want to go to Samaria. Samaria is in their mind <clears throat> where, where you've got some people who are like, um, the way they would call them is like half Jewish and half, half something else. And if you're not full Jewish, then I don't want a piece of you. That was kind of the mentality back then. And, and you, you just have these places where it's, it's not um, like Jesus is dropping down lines of um, uh, inviting vacation places. You know, he's, like, he's not like saying, you're going to go to Honolulu, man, and win a bunch of people for Jesus on the beach while you, you know. No, he's, he's calling them to greater works, but not greater places. And I think sometimes we want to be called to greater places before we'll do the greater works. And it's like, just look where you are. You actually probably don't need to go any further than where God's placed you. You just don't think of it as maybe a greater place where a greater work can happen. And maybe God's Spirit just wants to shift your mind today. And I'm already in that Jerusalem. I'm already in that Samaria. And I maybe just need to start thinking of that as a place where greater works can happen rather than waiting for a better environment. And so, man, th this, is, this is what we see here um, in, in the, the disciples getting this, this sort of first first glimpse, this, this first purpose of the Holy Spirit, and then it happened. And then it happened. Acts 2, 1 through 4. And we see, we see the, they're, they're gathered together, and the Holy Spirit comes down on them, and it said that it sat upon them as, as like pillars of fire for each of them. And, um, and at the end of this particular passage, it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so, so here's what he was saying. Like, the Holy Spirit comes down, and, and he fills them, and actually manifests himself as pillars of fire. And then they're able to speak in languages that they had never spoken in before because they were surrounded by a community of, of people who, who came from all places in the world. You see, there was an actual feast going on. And Pentecost represents a feast. Pentecost was after Passover. So Passover is, was, was when Jesus was crucified and then he was resurrected. And so Pentecost comes later, um, 40, 50 days later, and it's the celebration of first fruits. It's the celebration where all of God's people come and they celebrate in Jerusalem at the temple God's provision. In the Old Testament, Pentecost was actually celebrated and, and marked as the day when God gave his people the law on how to live. Well, today we look back on it and we celebrate it as, as when God gave his spirit and the birth of the church. So in this particular day, the disciples were, were gathered together and the Holy Spirit comes and then they, they start going out and they find themselves in public places where the world has already gathered and they start sharing about Jesus crucified and resurrected and calling people to believe in that. And it says that like 3,000 people believed. 3,000 Jewish people are like, yeah, that's it. That makes total sense to me. Now, they didn't have developed relationships. They didn't have like a ton of training. They, did, they just went out there and filled with the Holy Spirit, told their story, and God did this beautiful work among them. 
You should have relationships and we should get trained and all those things are important. But without the filling of the Holy Spirit, they become meaningless. Even in 1 Corinthians, it might say that you would sound like a clanging gong or just a loud cymbal. And so we see that it actually happened here in, in Acts 2. And so moving on, um, Hughes writes, another commentator, it was the best attended of the great feasts because traveling conditions were at the best. There was never a more cosmopolitan gathering in Jerusalem than this one. 3,000 people get gathered into the faith. And so I love kind of the way that um, Chris Walker puts it. The Holy Spirit works both sides. The Holy Spirit works both sides. It's important for us to walk away from today understanding that the Holy Spirit works both sides of the equation, if you will. The Holy Spirit empowers you. The Holy Spirit is like going to play pickup basketball with LeBron. Okay, so you're like, you're out there and you're like, um, okay, let's play with those guys. And they might look big, they might look bad, but you're like, I got Bron Bron. It's okay. I'm going to go into that because I know who goes with me. So the Holy Spirit works your side of the equation, but the Holy Spirit works the other side of the equation as well. As a matter of fact, you couldn't be here right now if the Holy Spirit hadn't awakened your heart and your mind to believe in Jesus. If the Holy Spirit hadn't awakened you to be, understand like I'm a sinner and I need Jesus, you wouldn't, the, the whole Jesus thing wouldn't make sense to you. The Holy Spirit had to do that. So the Holy Spirit works your side of the equation as far as like the one who's going to share their faith. The Holy Spirit also works the other side of the equation, preparing people to receive what you have to share for them. Well, don't just believe me. Let's, let's work through a few verses and then our, our time is coming to a close here. And, and so here's, here's what it says in Ezekiel 36. It says this, Moreover, I will give you a new heart, and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So here's what God is saying here in this passage. He's saying, um, Old Testament, he's like, there's coming a day when I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit, and I'm going to make you alive, and I'm going to make you actually want to follow me. And how, here's how he makes people alive. He makes people alive by putting his spirit within them. The spirit of God comes and he wakes somebody up to believe in Jesus and then to want Jesus. The whole, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That is not our work. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and so we begin to understand he's not only giving you power to share your faith, he's also giving other people power to believe that they've never experienced before. He works both sides of the equation. What else do we have? We have here in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, just kind of a highlight. And you were dead. I love a passage that starts out, and you were dead. You were dead. You started on empty. You didn't have anything. But God, being rich in mercy, he came along and he made you alive in Christ. Well, how did he do that? He did that through the power and the working of the Holy Spirit. So everyone starts dead. Everyone starts disconnected to, from God because of their sin nature. And then God's Spirit comes upon us and enlivens us, awakens us up to this message of hope in Christ, and we believe it because of God's working Holy Spirit. He works both sides of the equation. He gives you courage to share, and he gives them understanding that they've never had before. Well, what else? We see here in, in Titus um, uh, 3, 5, and 6, he saved us, this is God, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So how did he do it? How did he make you alive? How did he regenerate you? How did he uh, all of a sudden move you from like, I don't, you know, church, the organized religion, that's not, I'm not very religious, to like, oh, I can, I can, I'm down with Jesus. I get Jesus to, to like, oh my goodness, like I, this is, this is where my life needs to be. It's like, Jesus, you're my only hope. How did he move you along that path? Well, he moved you along that path through the working of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit did that in you. And the Holy Spirit is continuing to do that in your friends and in your family and in your relationships even right now. He works both sides of the equation. So let's finish here with notice and note. Notice and note. I had a professor recently tell me there's a few things that you're going to want to notice. There's a few things that you're going to want to note. Let's work through these things quickly. First of all, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit loves to do this. The Holy Spirit loves to do this. 
This is like a favorite activity of the Holy Spirit. If you've ever read the prodigal uh, son in, in Luke 15, that's the heart of God. He loves to see people come to him and receive forgiveness and receive covering and receive comfort and purpose in life. He loves to do this. This is like his favorite thing. And so the cool part about it is the more you engage with the person of God, the more it will become your favorite thing. You know, when I, when I met my wife, I was not a Red Sox fan. I, there was nothing for me to root for, actually, because there was no Marlins. We had TBS, and we would watch the Braves, and they were horrible. It was like Dale Murphy and then fill in the blank. And so I met her, and they were like super into the Red Sox. They loved the Red Sox. And because, I mean, spring training, on the TV, the whole thing, it was like part of their culture. And because I loved her, I actually started falling in love with the Red Sox. And now I'm a Red, now, like, I, now that's, I've owned that. Like my son's room is done in Fenway. It's like, the, I'm literally the big monster when Dave Roberts steals the base and, and we like change history forever. Most epic moment in all sports history. Like it's, it's in my son's room. It didn't start there though. It started because I love the one to whom that was important. Listen, you may not have a part for lost people. You may be scared to death about, scaring your, about sharing your faith. This may not be your appetite thing. Listen, I don't care. I don't care. You just need to pursue the one who loves this. And you watch what God does with you. You watch what he does through you. That gives us clarity. I wrote kind of a blank. Um, you'll see a colon there on the side of each of these. This gives you clear. If you're a note, this is clarity for you. This sentence just gets longer, and this is how we finish today. The Holy Spirit loves to do this and is really good at it, so this should be your courage. Your potential is the potential of the Holy Spirit. You've got that person, you're like, no way, that person's never going to come to faith. I don't know what I'm going to say to that person. I don't know how to begin that conversation. It's cool. Your courage does not come from your own creativity. Your potential is the same potential of the Spirit of God that lives in you as an evangelist. You need to start believing that, fellow Christian. We need to start believing that our potential is wrapped up directly in the person of the Holy Spirit. And let that be what gives you courage to enter into those conversations. Because he not only loves to do this, he's really good at it. I mean, he won you. And you know you. The Holy Spirit loves to do this, and he's really good at it. And he wants you to join him. So this is our calling. This is where you can begin to sense your calling. Like, like, this is what you were made to do. I mean, I know that you were maybe crafted to be a musician or a teacher or an electrician or a doctor. Those things are awesome. Those are secondary callings. That's how, that's the environment where this gets worked out. But the number one primary calling is that you would follow Jesus, glorify God, and make disciples. So I want to encourage you to remember your first calling. And understand that in every environment, wherever you go, there is the potential of the Holy Spirit to engage a conversation with a lost person that needs the hope that you've been living with, some of you for years. And then our last one is this. The Holy Spirit loves to do this. He's really good at it. He wants you to join him, and he wants you to join him in love. This is where we have a focus on becoming captivating and contagious. You know, there's, there's one thing I really want for my kids. I want them to worship and fall deeply in love with Jesus because of his love for them. And I have this theory, it might be wrong, but I have this theory that the more captivating I become to them as their dad, the more contagious I'll become to them as their pastor. And, and, and the Jesus that lives within me will become contagious to them. As I kneel down and I talk to Cora and, and Kate like on their, on their level. And as I take them to the beach and as I do things that they're into and as I date my 17-year-old daughter and we have late night talks and as I go to my 13-year-old son's baseball game and we engage in his shoes and his hair and females and all the things that 13-year-old boys love, I'm believing that if I grow in my cat and becoming more and more captivating to them that they're not going to worship their dad that they're going to worship the one who may be captivating 
they're going to fall in love with the one that I want to become contagious, and that's Jesus. So my question to us is, who are we becoming captivating to? Who out there, who is yet to call upon the name of Jesus, are we actively working towards becoming more and more captivating towards so that the Jesus and the Spirit of God that lives within you might become more and more contagious in that relationship. So I'm going to invite us here uh, to a moment of communion. I'll ask uh, those who serve our communion to come forward, and we'll we'll have a few stations up here, and then uh, I think we have one there um, in the side. um, Communion is all about us being captivated once again by Jesus being captivated by the one who gave his life and overcame our our sin and our death as we partake of the the bread which reminds us of his body and we partake of the blood which reminds us of his blood that was shed for us. We're captivated again by Jesus so that we might become more and more contagious to those around us. So here's the thing. Communion is Man, communion is uh, for for God's people. The New Testament tells us how to take communion. It says that we should examine ourselves and we should take it in a right and and holy way. And what we understand that to mean is um, that we should spend time thinking about our life. And if there's an area in our life where we've made peace with sin, it might be be sexual sin, it might be gossip, it might be disunity in the family, well, wherever, man. Like, if if there's an area in our life where we're like, God, I I feel like you're doing, you want me to do different and I'm just resisting you, then, then we would say, hey, and the Bible would say, let this moment pass and, and mark today as a day where you ask God to soften your heart and give you a different posture toward that. The Apostle Paul tells us to, to do these things, to take communion in a worthy manner where we actually examine ourselves and do that. And there's a, there's a second sort of encouragement to offering communion, and it's for all believers. It doesn't matter whether you come from a Catholic tradition or a Lutheran tradition, whatever tradition you might be coming from. As, as long as you call upon and rest upon the name of Jesus, you are welcome to be <laughs> captured again by this moment. But it is for believers. And so, so here's, here's my thing. I, I'm, I'm guessing that there's probably some of us in here who've been traveling with us for a while, who, who've heard a lot about Jesus, but never made a definitive move to saying, like, I, that's what I want. Like, I'm done considering, I'm done contemplating this message of Jesus, and I am responding to it today by saying, yes, Jesus, you are who I want. And so I want to give that opportunity before we have communion. And I was reading this morning, this is a bit different for me, but I was reading this morning how um, in the New Testament in Acts, uh, I, th- I think it might have been Peter, looked at somebody, uh, and, or it was Paul, looked at somebody and saw that they had faith and asked them to stand to their feet. It was a person who had been, who had been lame. So here's what we're going to do. We're just going to be in a moment of prayer here for a minute. And I'm going to ask those of you who need to make a decision for Jesus, who need to respond to Jesus, to actually stand. That you would just stand here in a moment and we're all going to pray for you. We'll all be in a moment of prayer, but you're going to stand to your feet just like that lame person did. And you're going to declare today that I'm done considering Jesus. I'm actually responding to his invitation for life. So let's have that moment right now. So Father... We pray that in this moment you would uh, fill us with your Holy Spirit. God, and I pray that you would prepare our hearts. And even now, I'm believing that there are are some in our midst, um, just like there were in that Acts 2 moment, that are going to respond to your invitation um, to believe in you, Jesus, to surrender their life to you. They've maybe heard it for the first time today, or they've heard it for a while man, they know who they are. They're just waiting for me to invite them to stand. So would you stand? If that's you, remaining in a moment of prayer, I'm just asking you to stand. um, And this be your moment where you say yes to that invitation, where you're no longer considering like you're in. Oh, wait a minute. I see you. Thank you. Spirit come. We pray that those who are standing would simply tell you, Jesus, that they're in. They recognize themselves to be a sinner and you to be their Savior. 
Jesus, they're coming to you and they're saying, forgive me. Give me this life. I want to follow you forever. I believe in you. I receive you by faith. And I will follow you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Use me like we talked about today. Lord, for those of us who know you, would you encourage us in these moments of communion? Thank you for those who stood. Father, we thank you for drawing them to life today as a committed follower of Jesus. Would you just remain standing, those of you who are standing? And we're not going to make much of you. We're just going to make much of God's work in your life. Can we just say thank you, Lord, and just say, man, that's awesome. Make sure, you, make sure you just love on them at some point today after our communion moment. Amen? We love you guys. Thank you for your boldness. Yeah. If we would all stand now in the house of God and let us receive a benediction. Now, benediction is both sort of a prayer, but it's also a promise. And so um, if you're comfortable and you want to receive a promise from God, just go ahead and, and put your motion, posture your hands like this. And, uh, and, I'll, and I'll posture my hands as the one giving it, um, although it comes from the person of God. Now, may the Lord bless you. May the, may the Lord keep you. May the Lord fill you with his Holy Spirit both that he might pour his love out into your heart deeper and deeper and deeper so that you would go and share it with others. Do the next right thing this week and find one person to share that love with. Amen and amen. Love you guys. Except like alone, it's just. <laughs> I'm joking.